Hi, thanks, Megan, and thanks for having me. I enjoy talking to canola producers regardless of where they're at in Canada or the world. I'm, I'm always surprised at the things we learn from each other. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as Megan mentioned, my name is Keith Gobert. I'm an agronomy specialist, Canola Council of Canada. I've skipped my intro slide, so leave this slide up for an extra 10 or 15 seconds. Typically, I have a slide that in, in, introduces the Canola Council as a representing the whole value chain, right? From seed producers through to crushers and exporters. Uh, and I also have a nice, interesting little slide that shows where 10 uh, agronomy specialists are scattered across that 20 million acres in Western Canada. But it doesn't really apply to, uh, to Northern Ontario or, or where you're at today, likely. So I didn't put those in and regretted that about 10 minutes ago. So um, I do have a couple things that I wanna cover. Insects tend to get the best attendance at our um, seminars, trade shows, our provincial entomologists uh, really do a good job of keeping growers uh, interested and excited. And, and in fact, we're generally typically scared of what insects could do to our crop. So that's not the slide I was expecting right away, but let's see what happens. We'll, we'll go with whatever order they come up in. Uh, I did have an introduction slide that indicated I was going to talk about five or six uh, uh, possible insect pests that are typical on the prairies and focus on flea beetles, cutworms, and diamondback moths. So uh, flea beetles tend to be our most predictable, unpredictable uh, pest. And, and I've said it that way for probably 10 or 15 years, and it just doesn't sound right whenever you say it, but we expect that somewhere on the prairies or somewhere where we grow, grow canola, that uh, someone will have a significant issue with flea beetle defoliation and high pressure from flea beetles. Uh, but we were never able to say where that's going to be. And that kind of explains why uh, every seed that's sold in Canada comes with a, a seed treatment insecticide. And for the last 15 years or more, we've um, been using neonicotinoid seed treatments. Uh, the challenge with flea beetles is that there's no reliable predictors. You really don't know if you're going to have an issue with uh, your canola as it's establishing because it's a really small window that's tied to soil conditions and moisture and temperature that dictates if you're going to have a concern with, with flea beetles. Obviously, flea beetles have to be present, but at least in our part of the world, we assume that they're there. We assume that they're there. I don't know, Megan, I have a question for you. Can people see that I have faces on my presentation or is that gone for, uh, gone for you? Uh, I'm not sure what you meant by faces, but I see. Uh, can, you, can you see my face and your face? And oh, yes. Yeah. I can, yeah. I've, uh, I've just got rid of that. It was in my way here. Uh, backing up, as I mentioned, it's, it's our, by far and away our most uh, problematic insect pest for canola. And it's for decades challenged us to try to manage this particular insect pest better. And there's really no significant improvements in our ability to manage flea beetles on the horizon that we can see. So one of the things that I've, I've always told growers that it's, tied to your ability is to establish your crop. So one of the provincial entomologists, John Kowalski, has a really neat expression. If we can get our canola crop to three to four leaves um, in three to four weeks. So that's pretty rapid establishment. We really shouldn't have any flea beetle uh, concerns. Uh, and that's pretty valid because where we tend to see flea beetle concerns is where the crop uh, is perhaps seeded a little deep, where it's a little dry, where it struggles to come up. Maybe you've got soil crusting, Maybe you've got a little excess trash from the previous year. Any, any number of factors that prevent that crop from growing well and establishing five to eight or more plants per square foot tends to set you up for some problems with flea beetles. I've got a bit of a yield loss estimate here as at eight to 10% uh, per year since the 80s. That's really not the important number. The important number is if you happen to be the, the unfortunate soul that really has an issue with flea beetles, you can, you can have significant damage or have to reseed as part of managing this, this insect pest. Now that's rare. And I have to say that I've never seen insects, I've never seen flea beetles be the sole determining factor for reseeding. Uh, typically there's always something else. It's a little bit like baseball. I like to use the analogy, strike one, strike two, strike three. You may have a lot of, a lot of flea beetles, but generally you also have some other uh, environmental or establishment issues that are happening with flea beetles that really make them hard to manage. If you only have two plants per square foot or maybe less than two plants per square foot that are growing slowly because it's dry and hot and the flea beetles, uh, insects are a temperature driven engine. So they, they simply eat more and eat faster as the temperature goes up. And if your crop can't keep up 
with some kind of growth uh, to compensate, you're going to need to use a foliar insecticide to try to manage that. Over and above the insecticide that I mentioned comes uh, prepackaged with each and every canola seed. A little bit of life cycles, I don't need to go over this, but one of the things that I like to drive home to growers is that there really is only one generation of flea beetles per year. Um, it's a little odd to think of it that way, but the adults hatch and fall and feed and put on fat deposits, and then they overwinter as adults. So that when they wake up in spring, they wake up hungry and they wake up full sized and they're ready to eat your crop. So they start to emerge as the temperature comes in and around that 14 degrees, 13 degrees Celsius. And they'll fly at 14 or 15 degrees. They, they apparently don't fly really well, but I've not noticed that that, uh, that slows them down in terms of finding a canola field. So they will need to know a lot about the life cycle, except remember that they come out of winter, they wake up hungry uh, and they're looking for uh, a canola crop to eat and they can, clue in on some, some uh, scent volatiles and some aggregation pheromones and tell them you know which direction they should be considering if they're somewhere close to your field. The thresholds for flea beetles are based on percent defoliation. I like to joke that the easiest way to get this right is to have somebody else assess your crop because 10% damage looks, uh, looks really bad. Um, so we have uh, a couple different infographics. We have a couple different picture diagrams that we've collected over the years. Uh, as it says here, the action threshold is 25%. We don't actually expect to see that your crop's damaged if the flea beetles were to stop feeding and you have some soil moisture to allow the crop to grow. You know, 25% is something that the crop could compensate for, but, but we generally don't see that as the case. If you, if you go from the top left there where there's really no feeding to 25%, the flea beetles are still there. They're still actively feeding at that point the seed treatment insecticide probably hasn't managed to kill them. So if you see active feeding and you have 25% damage, that's when we really say, well, you should know where your insecticide is or be aware that it's available at the dealership. Start making some plants to get it sprayed because we can see this particular insect with high numbers go from 25% feeding to 50% feeding in as little as a day. I mentioned we'd collected a number of pictures to show defoliation. Uh, growers, in my opinion, get excited at around 10%, which is, which is good. That means that they're, they're going to go back out and look again. And that's, that's the best advice for, for flea beetles is to start doing pretty consistent scouting. I'm not going to say daily, but at least every second day, if you've got warm temperatures and you've got noticeable feeding. What you're looking for is evidence of new feeding and evidence that that feeding is going to get to that 25% or higher. Uh, that might justify some additional management. The newest picture we've collected for flea beetles is uh, this infographic on flea beetle damage. And there's a lot of information packed in here. You can pick this up on our website or through Canola Watch. Um, and uh, it is essentially just a, a diagram with some picture cues there. 20%, we're starting to get a little concerned. There's a line there at 25% indicating when you can squish all of that feeding uh, damage on the underside and the top side of those cotyledons or the leaves, when you can squish that all together and you have half of one of those cotyledons, Remember, there's two cotyledons, so there's sort of like four, four half cotyledons there. If you could squish it all together and it covers half of one of those, um, you really should be looking at how am I going to manage these with a foliar insecticide. Now, if you look and you've got that amount of damage, but you've got a new leaf, this next new leaf, your first leaf is coming up and there's no feeding marks on it. That's an indication that either the weather or the seed treatment insecticide has worked. And if you've got no feeding on new tissue, uh, pretty clear indication that, that your problem is passing. I'm not going to say you should stop scouting, but you want to sort of have a, an overall view of where this, at, where this is at. When you're scouting for this insect, they do sometimes tend to, to be on the side of the field that's closest to a canola field last, or perhaps they're closest to the, uh, to the grassy edges of the field where they're likely overwintering. So they're not always uniform across the field. They tend to be more uniform as the weather's warmer and and, and uh, more conducive to them flying. But you do need to go across the field and make sure that you're not making that decision simply based on that one packed area by the gate where there's not very many plants. And for some reason, the flea beetle will get you the heck out of everything anyway. So uh, uniform view across the field. But again, that key trigger is that 25% damage and frequent scouting. Uh, I said growers will get excited at 10% uh, or 15% damage. It does, in fact, look pretty bad when this is a crop you expect to generate good revenue for you. Um, but the challenge isn't that you get excited at 10%. The challenge is that you don't actually go scout 
until you have a, a field that's at 25% or, or perhaps worse. So missing uh, that first uh, few days or week of feeding is, is what gets us into the greatest management challenges here. We've got a new infographic. This is a draft. Uh, I can't see it on my screen because it's a control panel down, but I'm sure I've got draft labeled here somewhere. We've had a number of questions about how seed treatment insecticides work. Uh, this may, may, not, uh, may not be of value to you, but trying to show that that seed treatment insecticide, whether it's a fungicide or an insecticide, does move from on the seed coat into those roots, moves up the plant. You'll see a fair bit of that insecticide concentrated in the cotyledons, and you'll see less. So don't take this as the gospel truth for how much moves where, but you'll see less into that first leaf and that second leaf. And by the time you've got three or four leaves, you've got enough growth that the, the buffet for the flea beetles is set up well enough that you really shouldn't see uh, significant damage to your crop at that point. But at the same time, those seed treatment insecticides are, are wearing out or, or are diluting themselves in there as well. New to the market this year, we've got some, some uh, seed treatment blackleg uh, products that work exceptionally well. Uh, they're at a quite a bit higher dose, which what that uh, right-hand diagram is trying to show that if, if you get the right fungicide on the seed at a high enough rate, you can get uh, uh, some protection for that really early season blackleg uh, infection as well. And that'll come up later as I'm talking about some seed treatment insecticides. As you're going out scouting your field, this is pretty typical uh, for a canola field. The picture here is, is one I've taken years ago. You'll see a bunch of feeding on the leaves. You may or may not uh, be uh, concerned here. You'll take a few more uh, uh, spots in the field or uh, as you drive your half ton across, you'll, you'll look and see if this, is, if this is uniform. And if it is, you're gonna wanna come back and continue scouting. On the insert picture here is, is from this same field. And the concern with this field was it just wasn't growing. It wasn't looking any better over time. And we had some pretty significant stem feeding. And I'm not gonna say that's usual, but if you do have cotyledon feeding, if you have feeding that's visible on the leaves, one of the additional scouting steps is to take a look at those stems and see if for whatever reason, whether it's cool temperatures or whether it's windy conditions, if the flea beetles have started to concentrate with a bit of feeding on the stems, we don't have a threshold for that type of damage, but we're gonna assume that it's significantly more damaging than a bite out of the cotyledon. So if you're, uh, if you're teetering on how, deciding if you're going to need to spray a foliar insecticide to manage these insects and you've got a bit of feeding on the leaves, make sure you pull those plants and take a look at the underside of the cotyledons and the stems and see if there's some additional damage that will help you make that decision that it's important to, to, uh, to do some additional management. I may have already said this, but for, for, for us in Western Canada, flea beetles are reported prairie wide. We've seen some changes from striped to crucifer, so crucifer are the straight black ones. My understanding is Ontario, you've got a bit of a mix. They do have slightly different environmental preferences, but that doesn't mean that if they're there on the edge of their field that they'll, uh, they'll not eat if the environment doesn't particularly line up with their preferred warmer, drier, or a bit of moisture. They're, they're gonna wanna eat to, to uh, survive as they've come out of, out of the winter. One of the things that we have noticed, and we have been using neonicotinoids now, I am gonna say almost two decades, um, the, the Prosper and the Helix products, um, they're not as effective on striped flea beetles. So we've had some speculation in the industry for years that perhaps we've been selecting for more uh, striped flea, flea beetles as opposed to cruciferous, because that tends to be uh, the progress or the, the trend that we've noticed in, in Western Canada is that most growers are concerned about or have only noticed striped flea beetles in the last number of years. And and this is a quote that of my own that I really like to drive home to growers is uh, no seed treatment makes canola bulletproof. Uh, we did have some, some group 28s that I'll mention when, we, when I have a slide on, on seed treatments. Some group 28s came on the market as uh, additional flea beetle control years ago, and they were really marketed well the first year. They had high grower expectations, and, and, and uh, the one or two growers that uh, I spoke with specifically related to that uh, were quite concerned that uh, the seed treatment had measured up to their expectations because they still needed to spray a foliar insecticide. So try to try to let growers know that, that while the seed treatments are working, uh, none of them are, are, are bulletproof. A lot goes into it on that little blue seed. Um, and for years, we've talked about are, are seed treatments worth the money we're paying? Because it's really hard. And I'm, I'm 
I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to answer this question for you today. I'm, I'm going to say yes, they are, but, but I'm not going to be able to give you really specifics. If you notice this, this is a top crop manager article, but it's from 1999. So to set the stage there, we had just lost Lindane or in the process of losing Lindane as a uh, insecticide seed treatment. It had a bit of repellency. At that point, we had some companies that put some uh, fungicide only packages on the market. Uh, and those companies offered that, uh, that seed treatment product for about two years. And if you talk to the, the reps that serviced complaints in that time frame, uh, selling canola seed without an insecticide seed treatment was considered a, a crazy idea uh, after that. So while you don't get to see what pear seed or fungicide only seed looks like in the marketplace now, um, it, it is, it is a, a significant protection that the companies have been offered. Now, 2022 probably marks the biggest change in seed treatments uh, for, uh, for canola that we've seen in, in uh, probably 20 years. Uh, for the most part in the last number of years, you've either had a variety that came with Helix or you had a variety that came with Prosper. Maybe it was Helix, Helix Extra, Prosper had a, a number of different uh, formulation changes, so slightly different names there. Uh, but this year, we've got a, a new entry on the market uh, from uh, BSF with the Invigor lineup. Uh, Vercorus, so they've got a different uh, fungicide package included in there. So they've moved completely away from the Prosper treatment that you would have seen on your Invigor in the past. Prosper is still available on some of the varieties in the market. Helix is still available on some of the varieties in the marketplace. Syngenta, though, has really begun to promote and, and really push uh, Helix Sultro. And the biggest change there is, is the inclusion of a black leg uh, fungicide protection for early season uh, control. You'll see that little picture. I don't know if you can see my mouse when I'm when I'm moving it, but uh, this little picture here is showing some black leg infection, and that's to indicate that this active is is targeted there. Uh, the same uh, the same logic is with the new BSF product, their chorus. Uh, they've got a different uh, black leg fungicide product in there, offering some superior. Uh, black leg or, or offering enhanced black leg seedling control. Uh, so lots of choices in the marketplace, including a new one, Buteo Start. If you're wondering how this slide works, the, uh, the yellow highlighted uh, uh, actives are the insecticides that are in the seed treatment packages. Uh, so Buteo Start is, is one that has uh, an additional uh, 4D, so not a neonicotinoid, the four A's in here the clothianidin and the thiamethoxam, which have, we've used for, for uh, like I said, about two decades, uh, have, a, have an additional helper in, uh, in the Buteo start. Uh, and growers uh, with some experience uh, last year are really looking forward to seeing what that might offer on flea beetles. In addition to all of these, uh, and depending on your seed, uh, seed supplier, you may also be able to get one of two different, I guess it's one of three different uh, group 28's uh, products. So the Lumiderm, the Fortenzas, uh, as an additional added insecticide option to your base treatment. And that's as by a base treatment, we've in the past been talking about Helix and Prosper, but depending on, on, on uh, which seed company you're purchasing from, uh, for example, the BSF products will see a significant amount of their seed uh, sold with Lumiderm added, uh, simply because growers are uh, concerned about uh, the possibility of flea beetle damage. I've included this slide and I've blanked out a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of other things. If you go hunting on the internet, you'll see some actually really good um, advertising pieces showing different uh, scenarios for flea beetle damage. Uh, on the left in this slide, I've, I've borrowed this from, from one of our life science partners. Uh, they've got it up online advertising the, the uh, flea beetle insecticide, fungicide only. Uh, is showing uh, a lot of uh, damage. This would be with significant flea beetle pressure. The base treatment, so in my mind in the past, that's been a Helix or a Prosper, uh, would provide control similar to this. But with an enhanced flea beetle product, you actually see significantly less feeding. Now again, in small plots, we'll see that the flea beetles do concentrate a little bit more and you can really show some of that damage that might be a little harder to see in a field. But we've also seen similar results uh, when we put bear seed or fungicide only seed into field scenarios. I mentioned 28s. I'm just going to scroll back to that slide uh, briefly. Uh, if you take a look uh, here, I've, I've indicated that flea beetles and cutworms are added by these uh, group 28 
additions here. Um, the really interesting thing for the lumiderms of the Fortenses is that that uh, active ingredient shows some really good movement from the seed coat and into the into the tissues that if cutworms eat uh, lumiderm treated uh, canola seed, uh, they, their mouth parts tend to freeze, they, they no longer eat, they die. I've really seen some, uh, some great activity from those added insecticide seed treatments. But there's a lot of species out there. The, the threshold has been uh, when you have patches and spot, splotches in your crop where the crop's being removed. So threshold is any, any uh, cutworm damage that's removing your, 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 plants, uh, your plants in the field to less than two plants per square foot. But as I mentioned, a uh, really good option for a seed treatment uh, insecticide that you can add. The challenge is we can't really predict where cutworms are gonna be a problem. Uh, and uh, if I can't predict flea beetles, I really can't predict cutworms. A couple different life cycles. The, the species that tend to be pests uh, are often uh, overwinter as, uh, as a larvae um, so that they're a little faster coming to eat. We've got 15 or 16 different species on the prairies, and I'm sure you've got different ones where you're at uh, that may uh, cause some, some damage to canola. So it's in, maybe not as important to know which species you have, simply to scout and see if you're, if you're missing plants. If you see some plants that are cut off, uh, you see defoliation or dry plants that, that uh, turn the color of, of nice hay quickly, that, that's an indication that they've died uh, relatively, relatively rapidly. It's not that their roots are, are uh, having damage and they're turning purple and slowly choking themselves off. Good chance if you see some, some dry leaves out in the field, Cutworm has managed to cut them off and not managed to trap them with their mouth parts and actually consume them. So keep an eye out for missing plants and uh, figure out uh, why that might be. Diagnostic uh, uh, feature of cutworms, uh, noctuid, the night flying moss, is that when you disturb them, they, they curl up in the sea. This is a really nice picture. They're actually harder to find than you might think, especially if you go out middle of the day when, when the soil's pretty warm, they will move down uh, as much as three inches. So uh, scouting in the morning or the evening, sometime when the when moisture is uh, a little better, uh, perhaps even after you've got a little bit of rain, uh, will generally make these easier to find. Group 28 cutworm activity. Again, I pulled this out of uh, one of the seed uh, companies, uh, uh, one of Brett Young's uh, web website pictures. Uh, here they've marked all the plots that had a group 28 product included in the in their uh, in their trial with a red dot so it, it's really uh, impressive protection if we can figure out that you're in need of it a new a new guides available for cutworms so if you're looking for some more information that's a an excellent place to start uh, cutworm pests in the prairies i am going to cover diamondback moss megan mentioned this was a concern for a number of growers um, I don't have it in the presentation, but I'll, I'll include it in my first slide. The easiest way to identify diamondback moss, uh, they're obviously well named. This irregular diamond shape on the back of the moth uh, seems a little bit uh, greener than it should be in, in this picture on my screen, but perhaps it looks different. There's some irregular diamond shapes on this, on this moth. These are really small moths. They're less than half an inch long. Uh, the worms are, are uh, about the same size. So these are tiny, tiny little green worms. I like to tell growers that as you're walking through your field, if you have these little moths that fly like drunken sailors, so they, they, they can't, they don't seem to be able to fly in a straight line. They really do zig back and back and forth. Uh, if you've dealt with diamondback moths a, a number of times uh, uh, in the past, you'll start to be, identif be able to identify them simply by the way that they move. They're, they're pretty characteristic. But more importantly, whether you have these adult moths or not, what you're really looking for is to see if you've got these small green worms starting to damage your canola. And in Western Canada, and I'm sure it's the same where you're at, uh, diamondback moss don't overwinter in our environment. So they get blown in from the Pacific Northwest, Mexico, Texas, Oregon, where, where, wherever they happen to be, and if the wind picks them up. Um, so if that happens really early, um, we'll be able to get uh, generation started as early as the end of April in our, our part of the world. If they blow in a little before that, there won't be enough cruciferous or canola relatives, weeds of any kind for them to survive on and they'll freeze. But if they manage to blow in right at the start of our season, 
we can see as many as three or four generations uh, occurring and spreading out uh, across the prairies. I think it was 2017, the last time that we had significant damage and significant spraying. And, and that year, right from Alberta to Manitoba, we had growers uh, talking about this particular insect and spraying for them. But it's actually usually considered a, a pretty isolated pest. You'll, you'll get a wind packet dropping off. And I don't clearly understand how this works, but you'll get a wind packet dropping off some adults. Uh, and uh, you'll hear about farmers worrying about them south of Regina, and, and there really won't be a concern um, perhaps anywhere else or maybe one or two other isolated pockets in, uh, in the prairies. And we'll monitor for these. We watch for uh, the adults with pheromone, uh, pheromone traps, not an extensive network of monitoring traps. Uh, and then we try to keep track of reports that come in for damage. I mentioned the weekly, uh, the, the wind trajectories. So uh, Ag Canada monitors uh, wind paths, either uh, forward trajectories, so to predict where they're gonna land, or reverse trajectories to say, where did the wind that stopped over Saskatoon, for example, come from? Uh, and while growers don't really use this, it's kind of an interesting exercise to try to figure out where these, where these insects are coming from on any given season. What you're really looking for though, is to see if there's damage or defoliation. Um, you can see in both of these pictures here, a diagnostic feature for this particular uh, little green worm. Uh, the first diagnostic feature is that they've got a rapid life cycle. So if you're looking at little green worms and you come back in a week or two, and they're still relatively small little green worms, um, and you start to see these pupil cases, the, the, the enclosed uh, little larvae here, um, that's an indication that it's diamondback moth because they're gonna get through that life cycle in as little as 21, 21 to 28 days. If they continue to grow and become bigger and longer and they get past that uh, half inch point, chances are you've got a different uh, relative of, of, uh, of uh, um, excuse me, either a noctuid moth or, or a butterfly that's, that's in your field. Could be a clover cutworm. Uh, birth army worms would be pretty common here. The other diagno couple diagnostic features for this insect, uh, and I'm pointing at it with my mouse if you can see it, but if not, look at these worms. You can see there's two prongs uh, at the at the back end of this at the back end of this worm, and that's characteristic of a diamondback moth. As is the fact, they're a pretty active little worm, and if you poke them on the head, uh, they will really wiggle backwards and fall off the leaf on a, on a little uh, silken thread. Uh, they're they're really quite active, and they try to get away from any birds that are trying to uh, trying to get at them or any predators. And you're essentially just a really big predator that they haven't yet figured out. The challenge is this defoliation. Uh, early in the season, we're simply looking at defoliation similar to the way we might think about it as flea beetles. It's rare for us to see uh, diamondback moths on, on that uh, young of a crop, but it's, it's not, not unheard of. And we've got a threshold of approximately 20 to 30 per square foot, which in square meters would be two to 300. Uh, and to give that some sort of reference, um, uh, birth army worms, which are a, a two inch worm that are native to our part of the world, uh, have a threshold of about 20 per square meter. So these are small. I like to make the analogy that these are a little more like gophers and some of the bigger uh, butterfly larvae that we might have to deal with are a lot more like cows in, in, terms of, in terms of how we think about them. But enough small little green worms can do a fair bit of damage. And they'll see that damage right from early season through to the middle of the season, uh, there are some thresholds, um, uh, two different thresholds based on crop stage. But we'll also see some damage where if they've eaten all of the leaves, they'll move up onto the pods and they'll start to strip pods. And you see a lot of uh, pod damage, early, early, uh, early pod shatter. So un unless you've got an absolutely terrible crop, you're going to want to manage this insect and, and not try to think that you're going to uh, be able to uh, wait for the crop to ripen and, and perhaps avoid some, some damage there. A, a nice thing to notice uh, is that there are a couple natural parasitoids. Diadegma insular is, is a parasitic wasp that will control these populations. And there's been a number of times where I've seen adult moss in fields that I expect to be laying eggs and expect to have a problem. Uh, as a retail agronomist, I've brought in a couple skids of insecticide based on the number of adult moss that I've seen and had this particular uh, biological control wipe the population out. So uh, just because you're seeing adults doesn't mean that they, there will be a, a problem there. And, and there's a chance that, that uh, um, 
natural control measures will, will manage this insect. And it depends if they've blown in at the same time as your uh, pest population. I think I'm going to stop it there, Megan. I do have a couple other insects I'd love to talk about, but um, I, you haven't stopped me with any questions and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Sure. That's great. Thanks, Keith. So uh, I only got one question in the chat. I have plenty of questions, but please do uh, put, put some questions in that chat or raise your hand or just speak up if you can't figure out those other methods. Um, so we did have one, though. What is the best insect insecticide for flea beetle? So, so I'm, uh, I'm not allowed to have a favorite canola variety. <laughs> Um, so I'm assuming that I'm also not allowed to have a favorite insecticide. It's really not, uh, it's really not, I'm going to say there's not a lot of difference uh, in the products on the market. They're, they're all registered for, the ones that are registered for flea beetle control are all, um, are all effective. Um, it'll just depend on, on, uh, on if you have a, a preference for which product you'd like to use as foliar. The, the two that come to mind, and it's not a recommendation, uh, uh, tend to be Desis and Matador. They're, they're the most common, but we've got uh, yeah. a number of other okay. generic products with those same names. Uh, the pyrethroids tend to be the, the go-to uh, products to try to, to manage this, this, uh, this insect as a foliar spray. Yeah, that, that's what I see too. And, and I don't think there are big differences in control from what I've seen in my, my experience. Um, and when, where we're using like a Corrigin on the seed treatment, we're usually saving our foliar, our one allowed foliar Corrigin app for sweet, sweet midge control or, or something else. So um, yeah. we're trying to wipe out our, our flea beetles with something else like man Matador. Yeah, we have had uh, some feedback from growers that uh, if the product has some residual control and that's where they see the corrigin yeah. uh, having some, some benefit, uh, they've uh, had some positive feedback on trying to control grasshoppers. Grasshoppers aren't a, a common pest for us. Oh, and I have that slide buried a little further back. Uh, aren't a common pest for us, but if we see a really dry, hot year and the uh, uh, pasture and ditches tend to dry up and, and, and uh, become less palatable. We'll see canola move or, or grasshoppers move into the edges of canola fields. So we got some, uh, some feedback that the residual from the group 28s was providing a little better efficacy there. Uh, we do have some brand baits. Uh, so some Carbaryl, some, I believe that's the same active as seven. Um, uh, Carbaryl on wheat bran uh, with an oil attractant that have been used as sort of bait Bait, uh, bait products for grasshoppers, but they really work best if they're scattered into ditches and, and uh, used as a more of a preventative uh, product for, for grasshoppers. So we're not particularly adept at uh, thinking ahead and managing and predicting grasshopper populations uh, until we've been a year or two into them. So uh, last year was a bad grasshopper year with drought across the prairie. So we'll see a little more proactive uh, management of the grasshoppers this year, but hopefully we get some rain and that's not an issue. Yeah, we sometimes see grasshoppers here. So if I get questions on that in the future, I'll, I'll hit you up with those. Um, I have, since we're talking, we're talking about spraying for flea beetles, are there any other tips on setting up your sprayer or like spray volumes for controlling flea beetle or is it just kind of according to the label rate or label info? Yeah, so there's not a lot of specifics. Uh, that hasn't been a, a target of concern. Uh, it's not like the fungicides where they'll, they'll mention, uh, you know, specific droplet sizes and such, but good coverage is, is, a, is a concern. Um, most of the products that are on the market work with both some contact and some ingestion. So we want to make sure we've got the leaf surfaces covered that they're going to walk through, uh, walk through that product. So uh, a finer droplet size, something while well, we don't want to encourage drift, but but good coverage is important. And, and if you add a little more water, that's uh, generally improves coverage. So if a grower tells me he's spraying three gallons and coarse droplets, that's likely not what he's gonna see for, for uh, uh, good control. And we tend to see uh, on most of the labels, we'll see uh, uh, temperature caution. You know, right. if, if temperatures exceed 25 or 28 degrees Celsius, that uh, you should be looking for, uh, looking to avoid those conditions that in, in the past, I'm, I'm pretty confident has been predominantly tied to grasshopper control. 
um, but but still, if you're if you've got really hot, dry conditions, uh, that's the first place that you'll see your low water volume and, and coarse sprays start to really drop off uh, in terms of being able to control being able to control those those insects, regard, regardless of which insects they are. I suspect. Interesting. So, do you actually get growers saying three gallons? Because I've never heard <laughs> that low <laughs> over here. I thought we were low on products sometimes, but oh uh, no! If you're if you're covering a lot of acres, particularly if you've got uh, a glyphosate in the tank, where where um, where coverage tends to be a little less of a concern, uh, we growers spraying uh, spraying products like that with as little as three gallons, mostly because they can cover a lot of acres with one yeah. tank. So. It's, it's not necessarily because they're getting better activity. No. <laughs> because they can get away with it. Yeah, no kidding. Interesting. Okay. I'll, I'll complain less when I hear 10 gallons and feel that that's low. Um, okay. I have a, another flea beetle question. It, does rotation really play a role? Um, I know you probably have more canola in rotation over there, but like, are they able to survive on other things locally uh, when when we don't have canola or my, my experience is they're just always a potential issue. Yeah. So I suspect that a, a prairie agronomist shouldn't really even try to answer that because I think <laughs> you've, you've actually hit the nail on the head. We have enough canola that flea beetles have a food source within uh, pick a distance, half a mile or, or whatever distance that they they are from the last canola field. Um, we do have some interesting new research coming out of the university of Manitoba. Uh, entomologist there, Alejandro Costa Mangus, is trying to correlate risk factors for flea beetle uh, damage based on field margins and distance to the last canola field and those kind of things. And and yes, flea beetles, uh, if I understand uh, in his preliminary uh, summaries that I've seen, flea beetles are associated with nearby canola. So I, I guess there could be some some interaction with rotation or more importantly, nearby rotation. Right. But um, my experience with flea beetles has been they'll move to find a meal. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I would not think that rotation is going to help you very much. Okay, awesome. And I feel like I'm hijacking this meeting, but I guess I'm allowed. Uh, I get a lot of questions about late season flea beetle, and I know we don't really have a threshold for that. Um, but yeah, do you have any comments on, on flea beetle moving in when we have pods on the plant? Yeah, so I've not seen... I've not seen uh, flea beetles do damage at that point. Uh, typically what, what we'll see is a uh, really high uh, infestation of flea beetles on the few remaining green plants or green pods on the field margin or uh, sometimes the calls I get are based on the two or three plants that are growing beside the bin that they're filling in the yard. <laughs> it's covered with little black, often it's cruciferous, even though we're striped predominantly in, in my local area, uh, it'd be cruciferous. Uh, flea beetles, the little black ones that are just covering a plant. And if you have enough, uh, if you have enough flea beetles, yes, they can strip. They can strip the pods similar to how a diamondback moth can. But but I, I, I think I've heard of, of, of growers trying to spray for them in one or two cases in the last 25 years. So, you know, it seems pretty rare uh, and I, I'm really uncomfortable even insinuating that 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 could be a concern, but it does it does come up for questions. So uh, take take a look at take a look. The one thing you're going to really have to, whether it's flea beetles or any other insect pest, when it's that late, you're really going to have to be aware of your pre-harvest interval. So if you are thinking of putting a product on quite late in the season on potted canola, make sure you've got a pre-harvest interval that's short enough to 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 uh, be used and wait for swathing to occur. Uh, but but I'm, I'm not convinced that flea beetles can do that much damage late in the season. And the other interesting comments that we, we always get is, is whether they're doing damage or not. If you're seeing a lot of them, uh, growers are then concerned that they'll have flea beetle issues the next spring. And, and we haven't been able to use that as an accurate predictive tool either. You know, if you see a lot of flea beetles in the fall, does that mean you've got flea beetle concerns in the spring? And it doesn't seem to be really well, really well correlated. Uh, what what helps us the most to manage flea beetles is a half an inch of rain two days after we plant. You know, if that crop comes up and grows well and the seed treatment uh, package that's on there gets picked up and moved into the cotyledons, um, they're, they're happy little healthy plants and we don't seem to have uh, anything more than a few, a few pockmarks. And, and with the insecticides we're using, the flea beetles do have to take a few bites 
to get a headache and stop feeding uh, or hopefully die, but mostly get a headache and stop feeding and, and let that crop get large enough that, that they're not a concern. So it's, uh, it's funny that I'd say half an inch rain is the most important thing, but, but getting your crop off to a good start is, is the first, the first secret to managing flea beetles. Yeah, for sure. Actually, some of your um, uh, photos you showed were kind of interesting. I've seen where in plots where we had no sulfur applied just because it was a fertility trial and those plots were wiped out by flea beetle just because the canola couldn't grow, right? So yeah, all the management factors are important. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions, surprisingly, but I'm gonna ask one more. So first of all, thanks for the cutworm info. We don't see cutworm a lot, but we do get surprised by it from time to time. It seems to just appear in one field and kind of wipe out one field. So um, it's kind of interesting. Um, with diamondback moth though, so two questions. If we can't really predict when they're gonna appear, when should, what's the trigger for scouting? And then my other question is, do your growers really use a drop cloth to scout? Cause I always get asked, how do we actually scout for this and, uh, and, and meet those thresholds? So. Yeah, I, I, I would say growers are not, uh, um, growers are looking for defoliation on, on the leaves. So there's no real trigger for, there, there's no real trigger for when you should scout for diamondback moss. So it's, it's going to be something that you find as a result of routine scouting or, or calendar scouting. If you're looking at your crop once a week and you start to see some of those adults, the nice part about diamondback moth is that typically they'll come in and well, the adults don't do any damage. So the adults fly in, they'll start laying eggs. You'll, you'll see a little bit of damage and it'll be that second or third generation. So you're, you're, uh, you're going to be 30 or 60 days out before they cause a significant issue in your crop when the numbers build up high enough. So if you can start seeing the odd adult flying around like a drunken sailor, that's pretty good diagnostic. Or you see, if you see some holes in your leaves, and, and that's one of the things that I try to drive home to growers is when you're scouting, if you reach down in the canopy and pull up a leaf and it's, it's big and green and, and there's no holes or missing, missing patches in there, uh, no discoloration, like uh, it's, it's like a, it's, it's like a, high-tech monitoring device that you just <laughs> tapped into that, that that tells you your crops your crop doing well but if there's a couple little holes in those leaves um start figuring out why because the challenge is you don't want to have 30 days later half of those leaves gone uh because you've missed you've missed a uh a, a uh, larvae that's going to chew its way through the crop and and you have more slugs than we do but i i often get uh, if somebody's really uh scouting aggressively up against tree lines in Western Canada. When, when we've had some moisture, slugs will put a few holes in leaves and I'll get odd questions about that. But if you, uh, if you find some holes in, in your leaves, figure out what's doing it because they're, they're giving you uh, a three week warning that something else, something bigger might be coming uh, on the horizon. Excellent, thanks. Um, okay, I do have a couple questions in the chat. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to unshare or if you wanna move on to other slides. I I'm not sure, but <laughs> um, okay. So does the severity of the previous winter have a bearing on the flea beetle populations? Uh, not that I'm aware of. So we, we, do, we do kind of speculate if, if uh, what each winter will do to particular pests that we have uh, a dry August, for example, and, and a, tough, uh, a tough winter with little snow. We're speculating at this point that our cabbage seed pod weevil uh, populations might be lower. Um, flea beetles, uh, what, despite the fact they're an introduced pest for us, seem to be really well adapted to the kind of temperatures that, that they're going to they're uh, uh, come into. Uh, if, if they have a poor fall, meaning that they don't have a lot of material that they can feed on, so it's just a really dry, open fall, maybe they, they'll go into the winter with less fat deposits and, and not overwinter that well. But I, I have yet to, to believe or, or, or have it proven to me that poor overwintering has been has been the factor in in flea beetle um, in flea beetle establishment so I, I'm not I'm not fully aware of anything that sets them back all that well and in my my baseball analogy unfortunately is the best story I've got is it seems like if you have a crop that gets off to a poor start especially if uh, you've got very few plants and they're growing slowly uh, that seems to be the trigger for flea beetles um, and 
population doesn't seem to be as 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 much of a concern uh, in many of the fields that I'll, I'll get called to that will require a foliar application as just just struggling establishment. Right, makes sense. Okay, thanks. Uh, one more question. So in Ontario, we do uh, recommend Swede midge pheromone traps. Um, and I think our growers are fairly familiar with those, but are there other insect monitoring tools or traps that can help growers predict issues in the field? Yeah, so we're, uh, uh, we, we do have, actually, we do have some sweet midge traps scattered across the prairies and, and your, uh, the audience is probably aware that we thought we had sweet midge and now we've got a, a insect pest we've identified as a close relative, the canola flower midge, has yet to do any significant damage, nothing like the fields Megan showed me a few years ago. Um, so, so that's good news. Pheromone traps for sweet midge exist and they're, and they're in use. We do have pheromone traps for diamondback moss. Uh, I don't think you have Bertha armyworm. They're a native pest for us here on the prairies. Uh, we've got an extensive uh, trap, uh, trapping uh, network across all three prairie provinces. Because they're a cyclical pest, they take a few years to ramp up and they take a few years to, to uh, have uh, natural enemies control them. We really can predict a couple years out uh, where, where they might become a problem. And, specifically start to pinpoint where growers will need to do more scouting. Um, but, but those are probably the most, uh, the most common pheromone traps. When you talk to entomologists, they are looking for uh, lures and, and attractive pheromones for, for any of the insects that, that we work with. But uh, those are the only ones that we're using, I'm going to say commercially uh, in Western Canada. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Um, so I don't have any other questions, uh, in the chat. So people should feel free to, uh, to continue to post questions. Was there anything else you wanted to cover Keith that you thought might be of interest to us? I know you had more slides. Oh, I had one, I had one slide on grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are a terrible insect pest to try to give advice on, uh, because we have, and I'm sure you have the same story. We have a number of different grasshopper species, most of which aren't pests, some of which specifically target grass species, uh, one or two that like broadleafs uh, better than, than grasses. But my experience with grasshoppers has been when they run out of food, they go find the next green thing to chew on. Uh, and that's where we run into real issues with, with canola. So we'll see field margins completely decimated because they're moving off of two miles of dry pasture. Uh, and it happens to be the next crop that they're that are moving into. Thresholds for grasshoppers tend to be, if I recall correctly, seven to twelve per meter squared. But uh, they're a little harder to assess. You're walking along and seeing how many fly up. Uh, we have some really good. It's old data, but we have some really good data that indicates under hot, dry conditions that threshold might be as low as five per per square meter. So, um, but but really isolated examples of them being pests, unless it's a year like last year where we have just drought conditions and difficulty for a really mobile insect like grasshoppers to find food, uh, in which case they'll, they'll invade whatever they can find. Interesting. Okay, thanks. Yes, we've seen, I know in sort of Temiskaming district, we've had Swede mid, er, <laughs> grasshoppers a couple times and um, uh, in the soybeans as well. Um, yeah, our uh, our biggest problem is lentils, actually. Oh, okay. Like lentils, but uh, so big acreage crop in Saskatchewan, much less so on the eastern side of Alberta, but uh, they'll actually trim off the flowers and pods. So the threshold in lentils is as little as two per square meter. Hmm. Uh, and they do similar damage to flax, where they actually cut the bowls right off of the crop. So so it, it's really crop specific, uh, what, what the threshold might be. Right. What has Swede midge been doing? If I'm allowed to ask questions, are you? Yeah. So Swede midge. Um, last year was interesting. It wasn't as bad last year. So we're finding them in the traps for sure, but but less and less, like not as much damage last year. I don't know if any of our growers or agronomists want to speak up on Swede midge. Definitely still a problem. We're still trying to manage them. We're trying to plant early, but get the crop bolted quickly. Um, have our traps out to monitor for their arrival. Um, we do have a beneficial insect that uh, we found in 
hundred over a hundred fields, um, and it, it's a wasp. <coughs> that lays its eggs in the Swede midge larvae. But of course the, lar the Swede midge is still kind of feeding while this wasp is growing inside of it. And so it may help uh, manage uh, populations a little bit, but yeah, anyway, we'll take all the help we can get <laughs> managing Swede midge. So it's still a big question mark for growers. I think we've done a lot of the research and there's not, I, we're not sure what to do next. Um, any, any uh, growers want to speak up on Swede midge? I, I think we found the flower gall midge in Ontario unofficially, I guess, uh, last year, but um, not expecting that to be as big of a problem. So similar to Swede midge, it just lays its eggs and reproduces in the flowers. And of course, there are lots of flowers. So, so far, it's not a yield robber. Um, yeah, Melinda has her hand up. Melinda, go ahead. Um, just on the Swede midge last summer, we had a small field at the new Liskert research station with canola. And I think the biggest factor was just that it was a dry spring for us. I, I was scouting pretty regularly. I applied when we did get moisture, but, um, but yeah, it was a slow start to the spring. And so I think just the Swede midge wasn't, wasn't there early enough to put pressure on the, on the canola. Yeah, for sure. If the canola can bolt before the Swede midge come, then that's our best case scenario. And and I and for sure, you know, it takes a little rain to encourage those Swede midge to emerge from the soil. Um, and so you might be bang on with that, Melinda, that that dry conditions uh, kind of delay that emergence and, and help us out. But I've tried to, you know, I've talked to Rebecca Hallett, our entomologist at Guelph, a little bit about it. And, you know, these are theories that she might agree with, but we, we can't really prove anything. Um, Deb Campbell is an agronomist who works with quite a few canola growers, and she's just commented that uh, their her growers are hardly needing to spray for Swede midge anymore, and populations have kind of fallen off to a point where spraying isn't necessary. So Deb's kind of in the central canola region. Um, Bruce Gray, Dufferin, I think Deb's all over the place in that general area. Um, any other any other things you want to say about that, Deb, or anyone else? put her on the spot a little. I know, I know uh, Ben Skabelholman works in uh, Nipissing district uh, as well as uh, further north, but in that area, they don't see, they don't really have to spray for it and just see a little bit of damage. So that's interesting too. Although those dairy farmers with that uh, rocket fuel, I think the canola gets grown pretty fast. Maybe that's part of it as well. Any I other? Can, hey, I, ben. I, I can comment on that. Sure. I, I don't know why we have less problem with sweet midge here. It's all the reasons you probably talked about, but I can tell you, we just do have way less issue with it. it well, there's two dry years in a row, some parasitic wasp uh, block, I don't know. Acreages are going up and, uh, and the canola crops look great two years in a row. So we'll see what happens. We're on the edge of our seat. <laughs> and is your acreage similar to uh, to when you last had a big issue with them? Is that is that acreage? Um, yeah, just regionally here. I thought that sort of ten years ago it was maybe forty thousand acres locally, and uh, in the last maybe last year, I don't know where it was at. Must have been twenty twenty some thousand. So we're we're creeping back up. Yeah, I'm not it's really really hard for us to get close to 40,000 if you think about the crop rotation issue just with other club root and everything else well, like uh, it, it won't be sweet midge necessarily stops us from getting to that it's just not a realistic place to be at really but yeah anyways um, yeah yeah and especially as soybean uh, as we get more soybean acres and earlier maturing soybeans we see more and more of those being grown further north I, I can't remember what the acreage was in Nipissing but we had 15,000 acres in Temiskaming so certainly on the rise. Wow. Acres are on the rise in the north and declining everywhere else except where we have winter canola. Deb, I, I, think see, I was going to say, I think you'll see a few more acres here this year. Um, yeah. That's my read on it, at least as well. And when it comes to the Swede midge, I, I don't really have any answers beyond what you're suggesting as far as, you know, the population. You know, I, I, I have this theory that we sort of hit equilibrium at a certain point, you know, 10 or 15 years after the arrival of the pest and sort of how I'm 
you know, they've plateaued and they've really haven't flourished here in the last three seasons, actually, we've seen a steady decline. So even on late seeded canola, having to spray it. So I, it's good. We'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Let's just be grateful and not overanalyze it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ho hopefully it stays that way because that's, uh, 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 when I did look at that particular insect pest a couple of years ago in person, that was, that was one that would cause me to lose sleep at night. That's not a, did, was not a happy story or a, a, a management strategy in sight that I could see that would work if we ever had a successful population here. So yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, Keith has come, we were in Temiskaming, we did the little crop tour one year and uh, it's great to have Canola Council people come out. They actually, the agronomists do ask me kind of frequently if when they can come visit. Um, so we're really grateful that uh, uh, you are interested in helping out Ontario growers. Um, so continue to ask questions and, and we can have other discussion as well. I know we, I had planned on having regional discussions on these calls and uh, maybe we haven't, uh, that part of the meeting hasn't really been uh, too hot, but, uh, and that's fair enough. I, I'm wondering, Keith, about seed corn maggot. So I actually see a lot of flies in the canola. And I don't know if you're familiar with seed corn maggot. Um, I was able to find some in the roots of canola. I don't think it's a problem, but in my six years of walking canola fields every summer, uh, I see more every year. Yeah, so we'll see. So there, there's a species complex there. So I just call them Delia flies. So um, my understanding is seed corn maggot makes up a significant proportion of, of the ones that we have. So root maggots is, is what I call them. We have some good research. It's, it's dated. Uh, it's fairly old. It's from Julie Soroka indicating that they could see some, some damage happening on Polish canola, Brassica rapa. They hadn't really in field conditions managed to show um, yield suppression on 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 uh brassica napis canola that we're growing now so there's a couple old studies i should probably look at before i try to remember them well i think they're, they're based around edmonton there was some <laughs> issues in edmonton air yeah so if you if if we have a wet season uh we'll um we'll have significant root maggot damage on roots and tunneling uh, you generally still see a, a good crop or a great crop. Uh, if you're scouting, you're pulling roots, uh, you know, and I toss a few roots in a Ziploc bag with some water. I have seen where you'll have like a teaspoonful of little white maggots down in the bottom corner of the bag by the time you shook, shook them out of the roots for a bit. So they look like they should be doing some significant damage. We haven't really proven that they, they are. The challenge is we don't have a good, uh, we don't have a good management strategy or, or a way to, to have a with and without uh, control in, in field situations. The last time that we probably had a product that, that impacted root maggots was the counter and furidan granules that you put down, I think it was 10 kilos per hectare, or 10 pounds per acre in the seed row. Uh, and they had some registrations, if I recall correctly, uh, to try to manage uh, root maggots with those. But, but they're pretty common. They're only really common in a, in a wet year where we'll see a lot of tunneling. We'll see some fungal damage as well. Uh, growers have tended to ignore them. Um, now that we have, especially if you have new club root scouts, you'll get some really odd questions about root maggots because it's, this is going to sound really bad, but it's the first time they've actually pulled canola roots up on a regular basis. So they start finding all kinds of funny things, uh, including root maggots. Um, and, but, but if you swung a sweep net or if you looked at roots, uh, those, those are the most common insects in a canola field, these little these little house flies, uh, so they're they're everywhere. Uh, we've yet to really have a concern about them reducing yield. So I'm hoping I can continue to say that. Yeah. So I just shared my screen, and this is what turned me on to them in the first place was finding dead ones in the field. Um, and I see this a lot, especially in wet years. Hopefully, you can see this photo yep. of yeah dead flies that the they get infected with this fungus, and it the fungus tells them to climb to the top of the plant and and die there so they can spread their spores but um this is what made me start looking at uh the roots for for those pests so anyway it's kind of interesting yeah no it's that's that's a really cool story where the disease hijacks their brain and has them hang out at the top of the plant to die uh, so yeah. scary <laughs> okay if someone was yeah go ahead um, you know, I hopped on late, so maybe I missed it, but um, 
maybe dig in a little bit into cabbage seed pod weevil. Um, did you guys talk about that, Megan, or? No. Didn't talk about cabbage seed pod weevil at all. Do you want me to try to, I can pull up a couple slides. They're, sure. They're in this present. Well, there. So what I was thinking is we've seen quite a substantial increase in winter canola in, you know, and that's the primary problem area with the cabbage seed pod weevil. But going back to, you know, 15 years ago when we had overlapping cycles of winter and spring canola, the cabbage seed pod weevil would move from the winter into the spring very quickly and it became a problem in both ends of the crop. So just any insight you can share on that. The other question I have is thresholds, um, particularly in the winter canola. I was using, you know, two per sweep as a threshold last year. And I, I, I think that's maybe on par with what it is in Western Canada, but I think that's too high. I think based on the amount of damage I still found at harvest that um, we need to be lower than that. So any comments around that? Yeah, so my, my experience is strictly with spring canola. So just to preface that right up front, um, we've had a, a fair, a fairly robust look at thresholds in the last 10 years. We've settled on 25 to 40 in 10 sweeps. So two and a half to four per sweep. I, I hate using the per sweep because that seems to give growers license to swing the net once and say, this is what I got. Uh, and the averaging benefit uh, is completely lost there. And the reason we left it so wide was the 25 to 40, just to give growers the idea that, that uh, the 25 may not be doing as much damage as they think. So if they see a little wider range, uh, and this was perhaps not as scientific as a discussion as you, as you, you would have liked to imagine it was, but, but our, our thought was if we gave them a little wider range, they wouldn't necessarily jump on controlling the insects as they're approaching that, that 25 or, or two and a half or two per sweep. Uh, we had let that threshold uh, creep quite a bit lower. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we had a spike in canola prices and growers were asking, you know, what, how do we do this? How do we manage this? My crop's much more valuable. Perhaps this threshold should be lower. We did let it, we did use a lower threshold briefly and we've moved back to that 25 to 40. I'm sure we'll get those same questions again now that we've got $20 canola uh, coming into 2023. Uh, it wasn't that price at the time that we were managing insects in the crop this year. But uh, the, the kind of damage levels that we've seen would indicate that that 25 to 40 is pretty, pretty bang on for spring canola in, in the prairies. The other threshold that, that uh, or indicator that we've used is if 25% of the pods or less have an exit hole, your damage probably was either, funny way to word it, but either your insecticide worked if you actually sprayed for cabbage seed pod weevil, or you didn't have a high enough population that, that they would have been worth managing. So that to me seems pretty high. If one out of four pods have an exit hole, that means you had a relatively extensive population there. But, but the indication from the entomologist is that they're not doing that much damage at, at that level or lower. So um, we'll, see, we'll, we'll specifically see a lot of management required in the first flowering crop. Uh, so if you're the first flowering canola in, in, a, in a neighborhood, they really key in on that yellow, that yellow coloration. Uh, but outside of that, we haven't really got any extra management tips or concerns from growers. Um, their populations had expanded. I'm in Alberta. Um, so they seem well-established every year around the Lethbridge area, quite warm and dry. Uh, their populations on the map would creep north for, for a number of years. And they've really reseeded in the last couple of years in terms of where we'll find you know, economic, economic levels, but they've continued to move west, uh, or sorry, east towards Manitoba. They're now on the, on the, just on the edge of the Manitoba border, and they've moved north in Saskatchewan. So they seem to be, you know, spreading out and making themselves at home, but don't seem to have as many concerns from growers as we used to. Interesting. Um, yeah, so the, the thing, I guess the only uh, thing with winter canola that's different is, as you say, it is the first canola flowering on the landscape. So that's why I think we're more uh, concerned about weevils in the winter canola and why we expect to see them there. Now, in the last couple of years, I think in winter canola, the problem with scouting and controlling them has been um, that they actually came in a little later. So 
uh, at that 10 to 20% bloom, they might not have been at threshold, but maybe just after that is when they reach threshold. And we kind of tell growers not to spray at that time, but, but then we, we do have a lot of weevil. So uh, in some fields. Um, great. The, uh, the related comment, but it's the same, it's the same topic is uh, we've been told, or at least that, that, that our winters aren't that friendly for cabbage seed pod weevil. They seem to be well adapted, but they really kind of stretches their ability to survive. And the other thing is that our spring canola apparently flowers fairly late in terms of what they'd be like, like to be looking for. So, so the entomologists speculate that, that our cabbage seed pod weevils aren't that healthy or happy as they get into flowering spring canola. So their, their egg laying is maybe not as, not as successful as it could be. And obviously they would be uh, much happier in winter canola. Interesting. Yeah. And I think there were some studies and maybe Deb was involved with them with Tracy Bowdy in Ontario, uh, but maybe it'd be good to look at that again. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? So we were supposed to kind of have a regional discussion on the Northwest and acreage in the Northwest is definitely on the rise, uh, but I don't know if anyone from that region is on the call or wants to talk. Please feel free to speak up. Now's a good time to connect with uh, growers that have been around a while if you're new to canola. Um, was there something else? Oh, there was another question while we're kind of waiting or people are thinking about their questions. So are there Western, has the Western drought situation changed or had an impact on insect and canola, insects and canola? Man, I can't talk. Like, are you expecting after this drought to have different insect issues uh, in the coming year? Um, we, we're concerned about grasshoppers, but that's kind of a non-traditional uh, uh, canola pest. Uh, so uh, dry, dry conditions tend to be uh, hard on cabbage seed pod weevil, so we're hoping that means we'll have less of them. But, um, but I guess the, the short answer is no, we're not, we're not really able to predict where the, where the, next, uh, where the next pests will come. Uh, based on whether mm -hmm. grasshoppers really thrive in, in drought conditions. But outside of that, it's a little hidden miss. We've got some, now this isn't a canola insect, but uh, wheat midge concerns uh, and areas that had enough moisture to get those larvae out of the heads and into the soil. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll see a few more of them uh, based, on, based on temperature accumulation. But, but in some areas, it was so dry, we anticipate that the insects didn't do all that well either. So. Fair enough. Interesting. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, yep. Uh, continue to speak up if you have questions. We're kind of winding down. We we're scheduled till two thirty, but we've typically been hanging up at two twenty, which is fine. Um, now I did have a request for your slides, Keith. So I'll ask you about that later. Maybe a PDF version of your slides to share. So thanks for that. I can send that your way. Excellent. Um, so any. Anybody have any other questions? Anything else to say? I think I've asked all my questions. What would be the, if we wanted to put traps out for diamondback moth? Um, I guess there's so many growing degree days or what would be sort of a, <laughs> a timeline that you think, anytime I've found them, they, I've seen them hit peak just um, you know early flower um i'm not sure how many days or weeks ahead of, ahead of that if i was going to put out some traps yeah Any idea on that? it's it's a pretty straightforward um oh i'm going to get the name wrong but the, the little white the little white cardboard traps with the diamondback pheromone lure in it uh we typically put them out right away we're trying to figure out if they've come in uh, right at seeding time so they're only attracted to the adults obviously so the the, the trigger is if, if you find an adult, then we start to look for, for larvae. So no particular uh, timing, uh, timing for when we start setting those out, other than we want to make sure we have them out early enough. And I can't recall, I think they changed the lures uh, once in the sea, middle of the season. So that could be part of, the, part of what might decide your timing, how long those lures are effective if you're interested in only putting, putting it out once, as we, we see we see a lot of those traps go out and then if they don't change the lure uh, and they need to, then the data is kind of useless. So, so no specific advice there. I, I've, we've, we've got a pretty, um, a pretty, I, I would say the traps are really isolated. Like they're more sentinel sites 
they're not they're not close enough to each other at least not the ones that i counted will will help us uh, get out across the prairies they're not close enough to each other to be useful in terms of spotting uh spotting local uh conditions so i suspect that the uh, that walk in the field and looking for those adults that are flying is as effective or more effective than than the trap but the trap gives you just one more tool to sort of look at look at the sticky layer and see if you've got see if you've got uh, diamondback moss there so uh, kind of an early warning system but not not really a threshold yeah. indicator no i i i uh megan i think laughed when i said looking at the leaves is, is a pretty high-tech indicator um literally looking at the leaves are, are the problem we have with uh, birth armyworms because they're cyclical five to seven years apart uh, growers aren't used to looking for them so i when we do have an issue a grower will call me and say i have these insects all over my crop i can see them from the road uh, by the time they get that age they're usually two inches long and they're black so you can literally see them they're the size of a canola pod sometimes uh, from the road and, and they can be pretty thick uh, but at that point all what's happened is those birth armyworm larvae have been in the crop for eight or nine weeks they started out as eggs and craw they've eaten they've eaten all the leaves at that point they've run out of leaves to eat and now they've crawled up uh, to get a little more heat and, and see what else is is edible in the in the canopy uh, had the grower gone into that crop and the same applies for diamondback moss had the grower gone into that crop and pulled a couple leaves and realized that you know a third of these leaves are missing uh, he, he would have found them six weeks before uh, but it sounds a little too easy for me to say look at your leaves but uh, regular scouting my coworkers get get uh, uh, in, inundated if, if they ask Keith what's important in canola this week uh, I'll put in a plug for our canola watch uh, um, um, output uh, we've got a, a every week uh, email that comes out it's relatively short easy to read uh, but when they ask me what's important in canola this week I almost always say scouting right like just get out in your field uh, it's it's amazing what you miss if you haven't been there for a few weeks great thanks I think you mean the Jackson traps they're white yes triangles the yeah with sticky yep. cards so maybe I can look into the pheromones for those and we could get a few sites up might be worth doing and i'm hoping just for those on the call that are in the northwest i'm having tarlock put some swede midge traps out because we haven't seen swede midge there we don't think or maybe we have but uh yeah we want to get a better handle on if it's moving west and that'll also be a good warning for manitoba maybe if we start to see them in the northwest i'm hoping okay. there's still a lot of rocks and trees between the canals there <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So hopefully they don't make their way over there, but but we'd like to know when they do. All right. Well, um, I have nothing else for you guys. If there is someone on the in the northwest, uh, if you wanted to talk about how canola is going for you, speak now. I know Tarlock has had some plots out and and uh, working on different canola research topics, and we've got uh, uptake in that area um and in rain so, order i have i have a question for you megan sure. uh, one slide that i have with five different seed treatments uh that's the most crowded seed treatment slide i've ever pulled together um the challenge there is though that typically growers will pick a pick a hybrid uh and the decisions made for them uh so if you got any feedback on seed treatments of preference uh, and even when growers ask me, well, how much will this cost me, this particular seed treatment? Uh, it's so combined with the, the variety of your choice that it's, it's really difficult to, to sort that out. The 28s tend to be 60 to $80 more a bag uh, if you've added that additional insecticide seed treatment. Um, we had some speculation about what some of the newer flea beetle products would be, would be worth. And, and actually, they're now included as part of the base treatment on on some of those Bayer products. So it's it's going to be an interesting year to watch uh, watch seed treatments again uh, in 2022. So any, yeah. any back on that slide or what, what's what been offered in, in Ontario? Well, I'll let the retail retailers speak up, but Keith, we're, we're even uh, sort of, we have fewer choices here because only 
five or four varieties will be offered to Ontario growers from from each company. So um, we're mostly we're like 98 or at least 95 percent in vigor um, and and just making choices based on four or five varieties that they sell. But I don't know, Terry or someone else, if you wanted to comment. Go ahead, Terry. I was going to say we actually uh, had a bunch of guys going back to around to Freddy just to get detail. So, you know, we've got uh, three skids around to Freddy. It's a real pain. Um, you know, DeKalb doesn't want to basically service any canola east of Winnipeg but, or Manitoba. But uh, the so far, the Superior Flea Beetle uh, control with Buteo. I even, I even tried to get uh, BSF to custom uh, mix of some, but it didn't go very far. <laughs> No, and we had uh, uh, when growers ask, you know, one of the things that he comment is, is um, if you get positive feedback from growers, especially if it's unsolicited, that's usually a pretty pretty positive sign for for a new product, and and that's that's been been the case with some of the Buteo users in 2021. Is they were quite pleased with the product, so be quite curious to see what it's like in 2022, and maybe general rains will mean flea beetles aren't much of an issue, but but uh, over time we'll sort. We'll sort out if there's any important differences between those products. Uh, we did have a question about fall armyworm, which I think based on the name is a winter canola grower. Um, so is would you know much about fall armyworm, Keith? And if I'm, it's... I'm gonna have to pass on fall <laughs> armyworm completely. Um, the, the only thing I can say is that the group 28s, um, the scientist are uh, gonna stumble on that. <laughs> <laughs> really really effective on every lepidopter i've seen them used on uh now that's that's as a seed treatment uh, obviously they're effective as a foliar as well but but yeah fall armory worm is outside my realm of expertise yeah and we we just had an issue this past fall where we had kind of a really surprising large and late influx uh especially in some of the southern counties of fall armyworm and they just wiped out fields and i had a hard time believing that a seed treatment would stop um the level like the amount of pressure that we saw um but uh so it says kim van overloop which may also be a relation of nathan van overloop and i'll i'll look into that and get back to you so thanks for your question okay any other questions a couple more minutes here otherwise keith our canola council uh friends have been always willing to answer our questions so is it fair to say that people can reach out to you if they have any questions I get questions from around the world. So happy to field some from Ontario too. Awesome. And thank you for joining us here today and spending some time and, and sharing your expertise. Um, so I think I'll just kind of end it here. Um, if you have a last minute question, let me know. But otherwise, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And thanks so much for joining. We had a pretty good number, over 35 participants today. So uh, yeah, it's great to see everyone. and. Have a good rest of your day. Have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Keith.